My dear good people of Edo State, I am pleased to speak with you once again to intimate you on the actions and steps which we have taken as a state government to control the spread of the coronavirus in our state. Before I start, I would like us to observe a one minute silence in honor of those Nigerians and everyone in the world who have passed on as a result of COVID-19. May their souls rest in peace. Uh, this press conference has been put together by me to intimate all of you on what steps we have been taking to deal with this pandemic in Edo State. I'm glad that I have with me in this press conference the Speaker of the Edo State House of Assembly, the Right Honorable Okie, who was infected and has now undergone treatment and the two negative results show that he is now he has now gotten rid of the virus. After I established the COVID-19 response team on the 23rd of March, 2020, we commissioned an epidemiological study in conjunction with the University of Benin Teaching Hospital to predict and guide the course of our actions which we are required to take in order to control the spread of COVID-19 in Edo State. These course of actions are supposed to control the spread of this virus. The work done by the University of Benin Teaching, uh, Teaching Hospital created a model for us. And this model predicted that after the first confirmed case of COVID-19 on the 23rd of March, we will see eight more cases within the first three weeks and a growth that will peak to about 500,000 cases in the last week of June, except we take some drastic actions. So you can see from the graph that the study done um, painted a very gloomy picture of what could happen if we did not take prompt and adequate steps to control the virus in a dome. We decided to approach this crisis in the same manner that many other developed countries have done. Our approach is to use data and evidence to take the steps and actions which are required to flatten that curve so that we can reduce the incidence. Consequently, the Edo COVID-19 response team, which I chair, and which meets once daily, was set up to provide effective coordination. And this team has been supported by the NCDC, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, Iroa Specialist Teaching Hospital, University of Benin Teaching Hospital, and the various security agencies. I am very proud of the very comprehensive governance and management framework which is aligned with international best practices and global standards because 
this is the fundamental requirement to tackle a pandemic of this nature. What have we achieved so far? As our health workers are crucial, if we are to win the fight against COVID-19, we have therefore emphasized their training, equipping, and motivation, because these are the frontline people in this battle. To date, we have trained over 4,200 health workers who are now manning our screening, testing, and treatment facilities. Apart from providing the safety and protection required, we have offered them life insurance and special allowances so that we can continue to motivate them. Screening and testing is key if we are to understand and have the required information to control the spread of this virus. Therefore, our goal is to screen a minimum of 500,000 of our citizens. The first of the proposed 100 screening centers started operations last week in Oredo local government, where we, have, we already have reported cases. And of these 10, six are primary health care centers and four are private hospitals. We will scale up these screening centers to all 18 local government in the state within the next two weeks. I am glad to inform you that the testing center at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital is now ready. We have begun our tests with the guidance of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, NCDC, and we expect that it will be in full operations this week. We have also taken delivery of another uh, PCR testing machine, which we are currently installing at the Edo Specialist Hospital in Benin. That testing machine and testing service should be ready within the next two weeks. With all the testing facilities we now have in Edo State, three of them, one in Iroa and two in Benin City, we will now have the capacity to perform a minimum of 1,000 tests daily in Edo State. With massive screening and testing, we will have sufficient information which is required to direct the decision, our decisions for proper management and control of this scourge. I'm also pleased to inform you that surveillance, contact tracing, and line listing, which is in, in Edo State, is very effective in all local governments. Every reported case is actively searched, and persons of interest, POIs, are thoroughly followed up on. We have started treating patients in three of the four isolation centers in Benin City, Iroa, and Auchi, where we have a total capacity of 300 beds and 30 ventilators. Our operations involve huge logistic efforts and coordination. We are coordinating over 500 people and training them to collect, process, and distribute samples, supplies, and palliatives. We have up to 2,000 men and women from the federal and state security agencies who are helping us to provide security for our health workers and residents while ensuring compliance and enforcement of our safety guidelines. Many of our people still do not believe that COVID-19 is real and therefore are not internalizing social distancing, which is required to end this pandemic. We have therefore organized our communication team to rally our people by undertaking massive awareness and raise the consciousness of citizens to accept personal responsibility to protect themselves and our communities. 
we are utilizing all available media from town criers, radio stations, billboards, and television stations to send our messages. As of today, Edo State has recorded 15 COVID-19 cases. Unfortunately, the worst may yet come as we expect a rapid increase in the number of cases when we begin massive screening and testing. The good news is that with the steps we are putting in place, I want to assure all of you that we are fully prepared to combat this pandemic and emerge from it stronger and a more cohesive state. We will continue to impose an a partial lockdown policy for now, but we will not totally shut down our economy because of the untold hardship which a total shutdown will cause to our citizens. However, we will review our decisions based on the evidence which we obtain from the mass screening and testing which we are undertaking. We realize, however, that there is need for, to do more social distancing at this time. Therefore, we are taking additional measures to ensure that people stay at home. Consequently, with effect from tomorrow, 20th of April, an order prohibiting the movement of people in Edo State from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. will be in force. This order will be reviewed after 10 days when we have increased screening and testing of our citizens. The security agencies, by this directive, are mandated to enforce total compliance by ensuring that movement is restricted at night across the state. All drivers and passengers of vehicles bringing in essential workers and commodities into this state or passing through a new state will be screened by health professionals and they will be triaged. We crave your indulgence to cooperate with them as we ensure the, that the process will go on without hitches. I also want to reiterate the ban on street trading, which was announced by the Deputy Governor, the Right Honorable Philip Schreiber, and to tell you that this is in the best interest of our people. This move is aimed at ensuring that all trading activities in this state during this period is concentrated in primary and secondary school premises, which, where we can strictly enforce social distancing as well as hygiene and safety precautions. We are quite aware that many families and individuals are suffering as a result of the partial lockdown. This is why we have started distributing food items to over 50,000 vulnerable families. And we will give medical support to even more. We are fumigating and providing water in markets, parks, and public spaces. And we have reduced taxes on small businesses. The situation we find ourselves today is equivalent to a war against an unknown enemy. That is why I'm calling on every citizen of Edo State to partner with government on this shared responsibility to stop the spread of this virus. We are therefore appealing to everyone to support our fight by donating cash, healthcare equipment, water, food, and testing supplies. We are also encouraging you to look out for and support the very vulnerable persons in our society so that we can maintain their dignity and prevent catastrophe. We should all show care and love at this time and be our brother's keeper. The government of Edo State is leading this battle from the front. And we have already spent over one billion 
of our limited resources so far on this fight. We have constituted the Edo State Fundraising Committee, which is made up of our sons and daughters who are captains of industry, religious leaders, traditional rulers, to help us galvanize efforts at mobilizing resources to beef up the state's government's response to the pandemic. The committee will be inaugurated on Monday, 20th April, tomorrow, and we expect that their inputs will richly improve our efforts at building the required buffers to triumph over this setback. In order to cater to the educational needs of our children, who are, to, who are to resume school on Monday, 27th of April, 2020, we have designed Edo Best at Home, which we have done in partnership with MTN. Edo Best at Home consists of interactive audio lessons with customized messaging, digital self-study, activity packs, mobile-based interactive quizzes, digital storybooks, and virtually moderated teacher-student classroom interactions. Private schools are welcome to access these materials, which will be updated on the Edo Suburb website. This period, I will emphasize, is a time for hope and an opportunity to rebuild what we may have lost over the years. It is a time for us to chart a new path. Our strategy is anchored on a post-COVID-19 life. Our approach recognizes the fact that we will come out of this better off. We are doing so much and more so that collectively we can come out to continue to dominate and chart our course towards a productive and more prosperous society. Once again, I implore all of you that this fight is a collective fight. If you see anyone around you who is not wearing a mask, a face mask, please implore them to, that by doing so, they will be saving lives. I encourage all of you to visit our screening centers so that you will be screened and where required, you will be tested to confirm if you have the virus. COVID-19 is not and should not be a death sentence. It will not spread if you use soap and water to wash our hands regularly. Because this virus thrives on surfaces which we touch on a very regular basis. So if we make it a habit to continually wash our hands, we will wash out this virus. And if we wear our masks regularly, then we will reduce the ability of the virus to be inhaled by us. Please stay at home if you don't have if you if you don't have to go out. But if you must go out, wear your face mask and make sure that you do not and you are not found in a place with more than 20 people. Don't be afraid. Keep safe. Stay healthy and be strong. COVID-19 needs not be a death sentence. If we all play our part, together we will beat it. God bless Edo State. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So, freshmen, you are now free to answer, uh, ask your questions. Please introduce yourself before you do. But before you start asking your questions, let me introduce the other people who are here with me. I have the Honorable Commissioner for Health, Dr. Okundia, 
and the Chief Medical Director of the CMD of the University of Benin Teaching Hospital, Professor Darlington Obaseki, and as I, I introduced him earlier, our COVID-19 champion, who himself was a victim of the virus, and we are glad and thank God Almighty that he has conquered the virus. Our uh, speaker, the Right Honorable Okoye, uh, Okoye. I also have the Head of Service, who is a member of the COVID-19 response team, Barista Okumbawa. You, you're now free to ask your questions. Yes, yes. Yes, I agree with you that the, act the actions taken so far across the country, not only in Edo State, has slowed down economic activities. I mean, if you stay at home and you're not working, you will not make money. However, if you don't have life, you cannot talk about an economy. So that is why it's important that we take actions and measures that will slow down the spread of this virus. Yes, the, these actions and the actions globally with oil, crude petroleum price at less than $30, this, you don't need a magician to tell you that the world is going to go into a recession and Nigeria will be, will be highly impacted. So as a country as, and as a state, we are working in alignment with the federal government to put together a series of packages, policies, and measures to help see, to see how we can reduce the economic impact, and but more importantly, how we can stimulate the economy post-COVID. As a state, we were fortunate that over the last three years, we had started a series of reform efforts. We've been looking at building uh, our electricity infrastructure. That will now be accelerated. We've been building our uh, road and production infra infrastructures. And we hope that after we go through this phase, all of the actions we've taken over the last three years will now come to the fore. We will now be able to rapidly accelerate economic growth. But for now, the reason why we do not want to shut down totally is if you look at those countries where there has been complete shutdown, where people have had to stay at home, somebody, and usually government, has stepped in to make sure that they keep people alive by giving them something to live on, giving them food, giving them you know, uh, the things they require to live. At this point in time, I do not believe that we have the resources as a government to feed everybody in the state if we ask them to sit at home. However, we, believe, we really realize that people, if people are not, don't, are not well, if they don't keep alive, then we'll, they cannot even talk about tomorrow. So we have to strike a very careful and delicate balance between shutting down the economy, shutting down the state, and keeping people alive. That, you know, I, I will tell you it's not easy, um, but the there's no evidence that has proven that a total shutdown has completely stopped the spread of COVID-19 or even reduced the spread of COVID-19. Um, view is that if each and every individual 
takes precautionary measures, even when you are undertaking your limited economic activity, that in itself will significantly slow down the spread and also help you sustain your life, your life and livelihoods, at least for a little for you, until we are through with this, uh, through this period. Um, we want to use data and evidence to make decisions. If you look at the model we are working with, if you look at the projected curve, the epidemiologist, uh, epidemiologist told us that be between the 23rd of March and the end of April, we will have eight cases. Today, we have 15. They've also projected that, you know, they've project, done their projections still the last week of June, where they expect that the, epi uh, the epidemic will hit its peak. And what we are doing here is not new. It's been done in every other country, and I think the, the nation has one. So what we've done is to domesticate our, us for our state. From the data, we are just at the beginning of the crisis. And our concern is that if you lock down now, are you going to be able to lock down for the next 12 weeks? You may need, there may be some crit critical periods where you may have to lock down. But that decision on what to do and when to do it has to be driven by data and evidence, which we do not have enough of now. We have done less than 200 tests in Edo. I believe that by the time we've undertaken about 5,000 tests and we've screened 500,000 people, we'll have a sense as to the prevalence of this virus. And that will guide us and tell us when to shut down, when to relax, and when to do what. That is what we are saying. So we will be guided by what we see and how we see this process evolving. In terms of screening and testing, how are we doing? First, we are screening across the state. But we are starting with those local governments where we already have cases. Because we are worried that there might be those will be the areas where you, start, you see community um, infection spreading faster. So we're starting with those five local governments where cases have been reported. We're going to areas where we have large population concentration. Um, and we are using all, we've mapped out all the medical facilities across the state. Primary healthcare centers, pharmacies, private clinics, 
our teaching hospitals. We've mapped all of them. And we have trained their staff to man screening centers in these locations. In addition, we are setting up mobile screening centers. We have 10 of them now. And these centers will move as demand um, requires. Um, like I said, we also uh, have gotten ready for testing. At this point, let me just uh, use this opportunity to thank the uh, Dangote Foundation, who have generously given us reagents and the uh, facilities the reagents we require and the kits we require to perform about 1,000 tests. So to answer your question, uh, the screening will be widespread. The screening will also be targeted at the areas where we suspect cases. Don't forget that as I speak, our contact tracers are all over the state following up on suspected cases. Uh, how many suspected cases do we have, Honorable Commissioner? Sir. How many suspected cases do we have? Currently, we have 197. So currently, we have 197 suspected cases. They are following up on them. And those are the people we are going to screen and undertake tests on uh, first. On your last question of palliatives, uh, first, it's a continuous process. Um, the, what we did last week was the first in the series. And you do not expect it to be perfect. Um, there were some discrepancies that were noticed. A few people did not take the message that what we are giving out is for the poorest of the poor, and that we expect our citizens to complement what government is doing. So it's really unfortunate when you find a salary earner, a councillor who is a salary earner, diverts items meant for people in his constituency. But for those cases we have found, those cases that have been reported where we found people divert, we have taken action. But as we progress, you know, in subsequent weeks, we'll make sure that we block all the loopholes and we, will, we are not likely to see um, the same reports of diversion of materials. strategy, our plan, first, is built on the fact that you cannot restrict people totally. So if the message is that you have a personal responsibility. If you say, because I want to survive, I do not care about my health, you will pay the price. And it is not fair on your loved ones who you may affect and kill. So I think the first thing we need to emphasize to our people is that government is not trying to hurt you or harm you or limit your economic opportunities and growth. What government is saying is protect yourself and protect your loved ones. Because if you get sick, if your loved ones get sick, you cannot run to, do, you know, run to the market to try and do the things you are doing today. So I think the first thing we need to continue, what we need to emphasize and continue to emphasize to our people is that they must, we must internalize the message. Social distancing is not a punishment. COVID-19 is not a white man's ailment alone. We have seen it, it's now here with us. And since it's here with us, we have to deal with it. So that is the first reorientation that we must undertake massively to our people. So, so as when we say, stay at home, it's not because we want to punish you, it's because we want to save you, we want to protect you. That is a, your first message. Second, if you are going to be 
infected, if you are taking a risk, then why not limit that risk? Why must you rush to the, to the market every day? You're not going to make your millions now. If anything, you run the risk of not surviving. So we will continue to push the message and to explain to people that the reasons why we have opened the market is for people to be able to sustain their lives, to be able to go there and buy the little they can and go home and feed themselves and their families. It is not a boom time. And that is the message we will continue to push and will ensure that we take the required measures to uh, moderate the number of people that come out on a daily basis to these markets. Um, fortunately, um, all our bordering states have taken actions to shut down their borders and lock down their states. We are a transit state. And the reason why we decided not to shut down totally, and one of the reasons is because goods must pass through our states. If we move things from the port city of Lagos, to the rest of the country. So we cannot afford that total shutdown. Um, and or close our borders, not, uh, not allow traffic through. Um, before I came here, a truck that was bringing beds to Stella Bassanger Specialist Hospital was held up you know, uh, by some of the security uh, men um, outside of Benin. And I got here, I was informed. You can imagine if we, that is, they were bringing in essential equipment for us to fight COVID-19. And you can imagine how many more of such go across the state to other parts of the country. So if we shut down and we lock our borders, that will not happen. We'll paralyze movement across Nigeria. That's one reason why Edo cannot lock its borders. But more importantly, what we have decided to do is to now set up mobile screening and testing centers at all the locations, all, all, all our exit and entry points into the city so that we can test and we can screen and if possible quickly test people, the drivers of vehicles we suspect may have been infected. State, um, education is a priority, and we've spent a lot of resources and time to reenact education, starting with basic education. Now that the schools are shut as part of our social distancing uh, measures, we will not want a situation where uh, children miss out on learning for an extended period of time. From the model I showed you, this epidemic or this pandemic is likely to be here with us for quite some time. The, mo the projection is that it will peak by the end of June. If that is the case and we find ourselves in a situation, position where we cannot open school, our schools, we don't want the ch our children to be at home for such extended periods doing nothing and not learning. It will you know, affect them when school resumes. That is the reason why we've been looking at options, see how we can take learning, we can get these children to learn 
under the supervision of their parents or guardians when they are at home. And we want to thank MTN for gladly offering free airtime to us and partnering with us to get these lessons, you know, the, the digital self-study packs and a mobile interactive platform between the teachers and the children while at home. We believe that uh, with what we have done, you see the Edubest pedagogy is very, very robust. And so it's not too difficult to extend it using electronic platforms and taking it out to reach uh, children who are not physically located in a classroom. Don't forget that under Edubest today, the contents, the lesson notes, the, uh, all the things the teacher needs to train the child with is loaded on the teacher's uh, device, their mobile device. And from there, they you know, teach the children. That has now been extended. It's not perfect, but it will largely get the children to learn even if it's not as optimal as it would have been when they were in class, but it will get them to learn um, a lot when they are at home. First, how did you believe you con where did you believe you contacted me from?
government is doing in tackling uh, this pandemic. Uh, for us as a state, we are operating from a position that's based on evidence, on data. Um, we realize that without a good and well-structured governance arrangement, you cannot win this war. So our emphasis over the last three weeks has been to organize ourselves, to organize our response, to ensure that there is impeccable coordination in the way we respond, and, and not, be, not put ourselves in a situation where we just do things because people say it is what to do. Every action, every decision we have taken and will continue to take will be one that is enriched by the experiences of those who have the knowledge, those who have the experience in dealing with matters like this. So I want to use this opportunity to thank the NCDC. Um, the Director General of the NCDC has been amazing, he's been very gracious. When we told him that we had two laboratories we wanted to get on stream here, he, he said, you know, unlike where he had to send people directly from his office, he allowed us to use the uh, experience that we have at the Ira Teaching Hospital to um, get our labs running. I think my final message is that I know people, there is no need to be afraid. We know what we're doing, we can overcome this pandemic, but above all, we are receiving tremendous support from the federal government and well-meaning Nigerians. Someone like um, Alaji Samad Rabiu, of the uh, chairman of BOA, gave us 100 million Naira to pay the special allowances um, and allowances uh, for uh, health workers. Another citizen of the state 
Ayurgidiahi has, has given life insurance cover to a thousand of our medical workers. So the message is that we are prepared, we have trained our people, we have the capacity, we have the resources. What I am imploring all Edo people to do is please do not panic. Be courageous, just observe the social distancing rules. Wash your hands regularly with water. Wash your hands at least 10 times a day. Make sure that you use your face mask. If you see somebody on the street that is not using his face mask, tell that person, don't be wicked. Don't kill other people. Wear your own face, wear your face mask. On that note, I thank all of you and you know, ask you to be safe and keep safe. Thank you.